everyone, you're watching The Esperanza 243. You're watching my book reading project of The Westing Game, Part 18. So this is pretty interesting, Part 18, we're already a little more than halfway through the book. Um, so I believe in part 17, we got to go over what Sandy McSouthers, uh, discovered, uh, doing some researching on some of the tenants in Sunset Towers, and actually found some pretty interesting stuff. And then we got into the 16th chapter, the third bomb, and we actually went, we actually, you actually heard it from me. The third bomb was actually when uh, it blew up in Angela's face, and she got injured. Or not injured, but she got some scrapes and, ew, cuts. And then after that, um, the some of the tenants are discussing with each other what happened and talking to the... Um, the police captain. And that's actually where we are. Alright, let's get started. Um, those weren't gas explosions, those were bombs, right? Theo pressed the captain. A nice kid, that Theo. Doug, too, Florin Bumbach thought. But how often had she seen television interviews of next-door neighbors saying, Can't believe he killed 13 people. He was such a nice kid. Oh my, oh my, what's gotten into me, thinking such a thing? The captain would not call them bombs. More like childish pranks. Childish pranks? That brat's capable of anything. Turtle stuck out her tongue at the sneering Doug Ho. Evil pranks of the devil, Crow muttered. Her blessed angel was almost killed. Crow could be the one. Bring hellfire down on all of us, Thea whispered to Chris. But she wasn't in the building when the first two bombs went off. Yes, she was. No, she wasn't. The captain described the so-called bombs. Just a few fireworks triggered by a squat striped candle set in a tall open jar. The ribbon probably had the air holes in the box. No one would have been hurt if the young lady had not tilted the box toward herself. A time bomb, Grace Wexler said, glaring at the person who delivered the gifts. An unhappy woman, that self-appointed heiress, the judge thought, unfulfilled, possibly disturbed, capable of the burglaries, perhaps, but not the bombings. She wouldn't have hurt her own daughter, at least not Angela. Don't look at me like that, Otis Amber shouted at Miss, Mrs. Wexler. I don't own no striped candles or no fireworks either. That idiot is the likeliest of all. Grace thought, but he wasn't around when the coffee shop blew up. Ooh! Ah! Oh. The excitement was too much for Chris Theodorakis. That was one error no one suspected. And Angela, of course, no one could suspe suspect her. Otis Amber was not even sure of that. Still, water runs deep, he said. He he he. Turtle could not let him get away with that, even if it was true. Otis Amber limps, Chris noted the next day. Her family kept reassuring her. You're going to be fine, Angela, just fine. The loud snore that erupted from the next hospital bed was Sedell Pulaski, pretending to be asleep. I still don't remember, Angela mumbled. Her bandaged cheek made speaking difficult. Her face hurt. Her hands hurt. Hurt very much. Dramatic amnesia, 
Jake Wexler said. It happens after sudden accidents. Don't worry, Angie Pie, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine, Angela, just fine, Grace said, despondent, despondent, I don't know this word, despondently. I'll be back tomorrow. Come, Turtle, in a minute. Turtle waited for the door to close. She touched her sister's bandaged hand. Thanks. For what? Another snore from Sidel. Just thanks. The fireworks would have gone in, off in my face if you hadn't pulled the box toward you. Here, I brought your tapestry bag. I didn't look at your notes or clues, honest. But she had removed the incriminating evidence. Turtle, tell me the truth. How bad is it? The doctor had to take some glass out of your hands, but no stitches. The burns will heal okay. And my face? Some scarring. Not bad, really, Angela. Besides, you always said being pretty wasn't important. It's who you really are that counts. Angela wondered about that. Maybe she was wrong. Maybe pretty was important. Maybe she was crazy. She must have been crazy. Don't worry. You'll still be pretty. Turtle said. But wow, that sure was a dumb thing to do. Sidel Pulaski's eyes popped open in surprise. Quickly, she squeezed them shut and uttered another loud snore. Well, what do you know? Her sweet, saintly partner was the bomber. Good for her! Chapter 17 some solutions. Monday was a gray, rainy day. Depressing. So was the stock market, which fell another six points. Turtle was jittery. All the airs were jittery. The bomb squad was called in several times to examine suspicious parcels. One turned out to be a sealed vacuum cleaner bag full of dust that Crow had set behind the incinerator door. Another was a box delivered to Mrs. Wexler. In it were bonbons, her favorites, and a note, Love and kisses, Jake. What do you mean, how come? Can't I send candy to my wife without getting the third degree? I thought you were looking on the thin side, okay? Grace made him eat the first piece. The next day, Grace received a larger pack, a larger box. In it, the bomb squad found one dozen long-stemmed roses and a note. For no reason at all, just love, Jake. The bomb squad was called again when Turtle ran after her partner through the lobby, shouting, Mrs. Bombach! Mrs. Bombach! Someone thought she had shouted, Bomb! Bomb! A hollow wind wailed through damp Tuesday. In the morning, the stock market rose three points. Bullish, said Florum Bumbach. In the afternoon, the market dropped five points. Bearish, said Florum Bumbach. Those were the only two trading terms she had learned. Madame Ho, a quicker student than the dressmaker, had learned more words. Partner. Money, house, tree, road, pots, pans, okay, football, good, rain, spare ribs. <laughs> her teacher, Jake Wexler, visit her, visited her in the kitchen before he sat down to his daily lunch in the Chinese restaurant. Today, his wife and Jimmy Ho agreed to eat with their only customer on the promise that he would help them with their clues and not take a share of the inheritance if they won. Grace laid their five words on the table. These are clues? Jake looked down on purple waves, four fruited seeds. Sea. He switched two squares of Westing Super Strength towels. Purple fruited makes more sense. 
How about grapes or plums? Grace was about to insist on purple waves, but plums reminded her of something. Plum, she said aloud. Plum, wasn't the lawyer's name Plum? You're right, Grace, Mr. Ho said excitedly. You're absolutely right. He tore one of the clues in two. Fruits, Ed. Ed, purple fruits, Ed, plum. We got it, we got it, Grace cried, leaping up to embrace her partner. I never did trust lawyers, Mr. Ho shouted gleefully. What about the other clues for sea waves? Jake asked, but the happy hugging and dancing celebrating pair did not hear him. Boom, said Madame Ho, placing a plate of spare ribs on the table. That word she had learned from Otis Amber. Sandy was proud of the notebook he bought with its glossy cover photograph of a bald eagle in flight. Sort of appropriate, he explained to the judge. Fits in with Uncle Sam and all that. In it, he painstakingly entered the information culled from reports the private detective delivered each day to Judge Ford's office. Photos, photo stats of birth certificates, death notices, marriage licenses, driver's licenses, vehicular accident reports, criminal records, hospital records, school records. To these, the doorman added the results of his own snooping. My investigator is having a difficult time getting into the not-so-public records of Westingtown, the judge said. We'll have to put the Westings aside and begin with the heirs. Since we're feasting on chicken with water chestnuts, Sandy said, I'll start off with the hose. Doug had delivered down. He read aloud from his entry. Ho, James Shin Ho, born James Ho in Chicago, age 50, added Shin to his name when he went into the restaurant business because it sounded more Chinese. First wife died of cancer five years ago, married again last year, has one son, Douglas. Sun Lin Ho, age 29, born in China, immigrated from Hong Kong two years ago, gossip, James married her her for her hundred-year-old sauce. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised. Douglas Ho, called Doug, age 18, high school track star, is competing in Saturday's track meet against college milers. Westing Connection, Ho sued Sarah Westing over the invention of the disposable diaper, uh, paper diaper. Case never came to court, Westing disappeared, Settled with the company last year for $25,000. Thinks he was cheated. Latest invention, paper intersoles. I can take some credit for those paper intersoles, Sandy bragged. My feet were killing me, standing at the door all day, so I said to Jimmy, Jimmy, if only some di somebody would invent a good intersole that didn't take up so much room like those foam rubber things. And sure enough, he did it. They're great. I got a pair in my shoes now. Want to see? No, thank you. The judge was eating. It was past midnight when Theo finished his homework in the dim light of the study lamp. The wind was still howling, and something, a word, a phrase, was still eluding him. He had been studying solutions in chemistry. Solutions, that was it. The solution is simple, the will said. He was sure of it. By changing four and the to the numbers four and three, Theo was able to arrange the clues into a formula, whether or not it was a chemical solution, let alone the Westing solution was another matter. And I am actually going to stop there. Um, mainly because my throat's getting dry and... The next part I actually need to, uh, I would rather put in the next video. And with that, um, I will bid you all adieu. I will see you guys later. This is the Esperanza 243, signing out.